Hello, my name is Darren Holmes, and today in AC electrical circuits, we're going to look at lab number four, inductive reactants. Under objective, it says inductive reactants will be examined in this exercise. In particular, its relationship to inductance and frequency will be investigated, including a plot of inductive reactants versus frequency. So chapter 13 in Shom's outline covers induction, characteristics of coils, and inductive reactants complete with the formula for XL equals 2 pi FL. And it gives you some pretty nice waveforms for inductance and you can see that IL lags VL by 90 degrees, gives you the phasor diagrams and gives you a whole bunch of problems to work on and they're all solved in the book for you. So under theory overview uh, we're talking about the current voltage characteristics of an inductor being unlike that of a typical resistor. So while resistors show a constant resistance value over a wide range of frequencies the equivalent ohmic value for an inductor known as inductive reactants is directly proportional to frequency. So the inductive reactants may be computed via the formula XL, which is uh, inductive reactants, is equal to J, that's plus J, 2 pi FL, and F is the frequency. So as you change the frequency, you can see you're going to change the value of XL. And continuing on, under theory overview, it says the magnitude of inductive reactants may be determined experimentally by feeding an inductor a known current, measuring the resulting voltage and dividing the two following Ohm's law. Now it says an AC current source may be approximated by placing a large resistance in series with the AC voltage, the resistance being considerably larger than the maximum reactants expected. So under equipment you can see we're going to need an AC function generator, an oscilloscope, and a DMM. Just to remind you we're going to be using the Keysight EDUX 1002G digital storage oscilloscope and this gives us the built-in function generator. The DMM we're going to use a Mastec MSM 9803 and you can see we're going to be using three components today, a 10k ohm resistor and down the side of the page I've given you the uh, color code for the resistor so that you can easily find it in your parts kit. We're also going to need a 1 millihenry and 10 millihenry inductor. And you can see our schematic is going to be fairly simple today. We're just going to have the AC function generator going through a resistor and an inductor so it's a basic series circuit. So under our procedure uh, we're going to create a current source uh, just using a standard function generator so don't worry too much about it. Uh, using the circuit of figure 4.1 with V in of 10 volts peak to peak and R of 10k and assume that the reactance in the inductor is much smaller than 10k and can be ignored. So we're basically ignoring our inductor in the circuit and we're going to determine the circulating current using the component values and record in table 4.1. So we're just going to have a 10 volt peak to peak going through a 10k ohm resistor. So using Ohm's law, V equals IR, I equals V over R, we're going to take our 10 volt peak to peak and divide it by our 10k ohm resistor and we're going to end up with one milliamp and note that it is peak to peak. And finishing off step one under procedure, we're going to be measuring our uh, resistor and our two inductors that we're going to be using today and we'll record those results too. So I just wanted to show you our two inductors for today. One's labeled 102 and one is labeled 103. So the 102 is going to be 1 millihenry and 103 will be the 10 millihenries. So using my ohm meter and checking my 10k ohm resistor, we can see it's 9.96k ohms. So checking my 1 millihenry inductor, you can see it's approximately 1.9 ohms. 
So checking my 10 millihenry inductor, you can see its resistance is a lot higher at 22 ohms. So under equipment, you can see I have recorded the AC function generator as being the Keysight model EDUX1002G. I haven't bothered with the serial number, it's hard to find on the back and it's not important for this lab. Under oscilloscope, I've also written in Keysight, it's still the EDUX1002G oscilloscope that has the built-in function generator. Our digital multimeter is the Mastec MSM9803. Now you can see I've recorded my 10k ohm resistor as being 9.96k ohms. My 1 millihenry inductor was 1.9 ohms. Now keep in mind yours may say something different, so don't be uh, put off if yours is higher or lower than the 1.9 ohms. Uh, my 10 millihenry inductor was 22 ohms, so yours should be somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, keep in mind a 1 millihenry inductor will be labeled 102, and a 10 millihenry inductor is labeled 103. So in table 4.1, I've made a note of my R coil of the 10 millihenry as 22 ohms, and it was labeled 103, and the R coil of the 1 millihenry was 1 1.9 ohms, and it was labeled 102. So under procedure, step number two, we're going to be measuring reactants. So we're going to build the circuit of figure 4.1 using R of 10K and L of 10 millihenries. Uh, we're going to place one probe across the generator and another across the inductor. We're to set the generator to a 1 kilohertz sine wave, so that's 1000 hertz. And we need to set it up for 10 volts peak to peak. So setting up for 10 volts peak to peak will have to be done on the oscilloscope. And we're going to make sure that the bandwidth limit of the oscilloscope is engaged for both channels to reduce signal noise and to make for more accurate readings. So I've set up my circuit and you can see that I have used the three binding posts that I've used in previous labs. I have the main input from the function generator going through the red wire going to one side of my 10k ohm resistor the other side of my 10k ohm resistor goes to my inductor. The output of the inductor goes to the black wire that goes back to the common of the function generator. At the midpoint I have a yellow wire. At the junction where the inductor meets the resistor. I've taken my inductor out so you can see the yellow wire does indeed connect with one side of the resistor. It's very important when you're putting the inductor in the circuit that you don't spread the leads too far apart or they will break off the inductor. The inductor itself is made of very very fine wire and these long legs are soldered to that fine wire and if you pull on them too hard they'll break off the wire. So channel 1 of my oscilloscope will go to the white terminal, channel 2 of the oscilloscope will go to the yellow terminal, and all the black commons go together in my red terminal. So under procedure, step number 2, we're to set the generator to a 1 kilohertz sine wave at 10 volts peak to peak and make sure the bandwidth limit of the oscilloscope is engaged. So I just want to remind you from last week how we go about setting up our oscilloscope. Right now it's set up to the last thing anybody ever did with it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a default setup. And we want to select factory default. And select OK. So now it's put all our settings back to the factory settings so that we can all start at the same place. So what we need to do is turn on our wave generator. 
So I'm going to press the Wave Gen button. And we already have it set for sine wave. It's already at 1 kilohertz. The amplitude is 500 millivolts peak to peak. So I'm going to select that menu item. And now the entry knob can be rotated to change the voltage. We need to change that up until it says 10 volts peak to peak. So once we've done that, we want to get a couple cycles showing across the screen. So I'm going to adjust the horizontal scale. And now I can see I'm getting a couple of uh, cycles across the screen. I've got it at 200 microseconds. Uh, the next thing I want to do is make sure the waveform fits on the screen. So I'm going to rotate my uh, volts per division knob until I can see it on the screen. Now one of the things you'll notice on my screen, it says uh, 20 volts per division and I set up the function generator for 10 volts uh, peak to peak. So I'm going to check my channel 1 menu settings and the first item is coupling so I need to change that to AC since this is an AC lab. Bandwidth limit just cleans up your signal a little bit so make sure that that is highlighted with a little uh, blue button in the center fine is off invert is off and then my probe I can see the probe is at 10 to 1 so I need to change that until it says 1 to 1 so now you can see in the top corner of my screen that I'm 2 volts per division and BW stands for bandwidth limit on. Now you notice channel 2 is not highlighted so I can't see anything on channel 2 so I'm going to press channel 2's menu button and I'm going to change the coupling to AC. Now keep in mind this is the voltage drop across the inductor so I want my bandwidth limit on and I'm going to set my probe and you can see probe is on 10 to 1 so we need to select 1 to 1. Now the next thing I'm going to do is adjust the uh, scale for channel 2 so I can see a little bit more of the waveform on the screen now I don't like it when my output waveform is actually larger than my input waveform so I try to keep it smaller just so I can see the relationship between the two even though one's on 2 volts per division that's my input signal and channel 2 is on 20 millivolts per division so channel 2 is much smaller than channel 1 so I like to keep it visually on the screen smaller than channel 1 now the next thing I want to mention is sometimes this waveform can have a lot of distortion on it. Uh, it's 20 millivolts um, per division so it's a very small signal and it can pick up uh, signals out of the air. So CBC is still on the air, that signal is going through and being picked up by your circuit. So one thing we can do is if, you're, if you have a very fuzzy waveform you can go to the horizontal scale and select acquire and under acquire menu there's an acquire mode so if you select that you can select peak or averaging so if you select averaging and then below it will say the number of averages I like to select somewhere around uh, 32 to 64 averages the more averages you select the longer it takes the oscilloscope to average those out and display it on the screen so you could see a delay when you're changing frequencies. So you can see by using the acquire button and changing the acquire mode to averaging it gives you a thinner waveform so it'll be a lot easier for you to take some of your measurements with. But only use this if you're having a problem with your waveform and it's picking up too much noise out of the air around you. 
Now the next thing I want to do is I want some measurements on the screen because I don't want to have to keep saying, okay, how many divisions does my waveform cover? So to do that, I press the measure button and you can see at the bottom of the screen I already have frequency for channel 1 and peak to peak for channel 1. So I want the peak to peak for channel 2 so under source I'm gonna select channel 2. Under type where it says frequency I want to select peak to peak voltage so that's at the top of the menu here voltage peak to peak and then you can press the entry button and it should add that menu item to the screen for you. So now I have everything set up appropriately to start taking some measurements. So under procedure, step number three, we're going to calculate the theoretical value of XL using the measured inductor value and record this in table 4.2. So in table 4.2, we have a frequency of 1 kilohertz, and we want to calculate XL. Now XL is equal to 2 pi FL, and L is 10 millihenries, F is 1K. So the equation becomes 2 times pi times 1K times 10 millihenries. So on my calculator, the calculation is 2 times pi times 1 times 10 to the exponent 3 times 10 to the exponent minus 3. And that equals 62.83 ohms. So in your table, write down 62.83 ohms. Remember, XL is resistance and it's measured in ohms. So under procedure, step number four, we're going to record the peak-to-peak -peak inductor voltage and record this in table 4.2. So under step number four, you can see I have my frequency at one kilohertz. My peak-to-peak -peak on channel one is close to 10 volts. So that's 10 volts peak-to-peak. -peak. Channel two, which is the voltage drop across my inductor, is about 68 millivolts. So I'm going to record this in table 4.2. Under procedure, step number five, we're using the source current from table 4.1 and the measured inductor voltage to determine the experimental reactance and record it in table 4.2. We're also going to compute and record the deviation. I just want to remind everybody that to calculate deviation we're going to use the percent error formula and this was shown below in lab number one where percent error equals the absolute value of the theoretical value minus the experimental value divided by the theoretical value times 100 percent so for XL experimental V equals IR, basic Ohm's law. R is equal to V over I. So V equals the 68 millivolts. And I equals 1 milliamp from table 4.1. The answer being 68 ohms. So the 68 ohms experimental compares favorably to the 62.83 ohms calculated in theory. Under procedure, step number six, we're going to repeat steps three through five for the remaining frequencies of table 4.2. So I have wave gen highlighted and I have the wave gen menu items on my screen and I've changed my frequency up to two kilohertz. You can see that the voltage drop across my inductor looks like it's larger than my input voltage so I'm going to change my volts per division for channel 2 back down so that it actually looks smaller than my input voltage and as I increase the frequency I'm going to get more cycles on the screen so I'm going to adjust the horizontal 
So I only get a couple cycles on the screen. I'm going to continue to do this as I take each of my measurements. So at 2 kilohertz, you can see the voltage drop across my inductor is about 128 millivolts. So at 3 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my inductor is 196 millivolts. At 4 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my inductor is 256 millivolts. And once again, I've changed the volts per division for my channel 2 as well as the horizontal scale. At 5 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my inductor is 312 millivolts. At 6 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my inductor is 372 millivolts. Now you'll notice we have jumped the uh, frequency by 2 kilohertz, so we're now at 8 kilohertz. The voltage drop across my inductor is now 500 millivolts. And once again, I've changed my scale for channel 2. I'm now at 200 millivolts per division. And my horizontal or time scale is now at 20 microseconds per division. Then finally, increasing my frequency by another 2 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my inductor is now 632 millivolts. So you can see on table 4.2, I've put down the voltage across my inductor for all the different frequencies. I'm going to come back later and do the calculation for XL theory, XL experimental, and percent deviation. Under procedures, step number seven, we're going to replace the 10 millihenry inductor with the one millihenry unit and repeat steps two through six, recording the results in table 4.3. So I've replaced the 10 millihenry inductor, the 103, with the one millihenry inductor labeled 102. So in table 4.2, the frequency range was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, and 10 kilohertz. On table 4.3, the frequency now starts at 10 kilohertz, and we work our way up to 100 kilohertz. So under procedure step number 7, I have now replaced my 10 millihenry inductor with the 1 millihenry inductor. And we're going to start our table off at 10 kilohertz. So you can see here at 10 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my inductor, that's the uh, 1 millihenry inductor, is 61.6 millivolts. So I'm going to record that in table 4.3. So we're increasing our frequency in steps of 10 kilohertz. So at 20 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my inductor is 124 millivolts. And I've had to change my channel to volts per division. So I'm now at 50 millivolts per division. And the horizontal scale is now at 10 microseconds. So increasing the frequency to 30 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my inductor is 186 millivolts. At 40 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my inductor is 240 millivolts. At 50 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my inductor is 316 millivolts. And once again, I've changed the channel to scale to 100 millivolts per division and my horizontal or time scale to 5 microseconds per division. At 60 kilohertz the voltage drop across my inductor is 382 millivolts. So I've increased my frequency by 20 kilohertz so now I'm at 80 kilohertz uh, once again, I'm going to adjust the channel 2 scale to make sure that my channel 2 or voltage drop across the inductor is smaller than my input waveform 
and you can see that the voltage drop across my inductor is now 508 millivolts. Then finally increasing by another 20 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz, the voltage drop across my inductor is now 648 millivolts. So I'm going to record all of these results in table 4.3. So you'll notice on table 4.2 and table 4.3 the voltage peak to peak dropped across the inductor seems to be about the same for both charts. So for the 10 millihenry inductor at 1 kilohertz we're dropping 68 millivolts across it. For the 1 millihenry inductor at 10 kilohertz we're dropping 61.6 millivolts across it. Under procedure, step number 8, we're going to be using the data of tables 4.2 and 4.3 to create plots of inductive reactants versus frequency. So in order to plot inductive reactants, we need to calculate it. So that's the XL EXP column in both tables. To get those columns, we'll remember that XL is measured in ohms, and basic ohms law is V equals IR, so R equals V divided by I. So we're going to take the uh, voltage readings for the inductor at the different frequencies, and we're going to divide it by our I source. So once you've got all your calculations done for XL, you can move on to the plot. So to plot inductive reactants versus frequency, we're going to turn our paper sideways and put it in the landscape mode. So you can see table 4.2 goes 1 kilohertz, 2 kilohertz, up to 10 kilohertz. And I want to graph that on the same chart as table 4.3. So you can see the frequency on table 4.3 goes 10, 20, 30 all the way up to 100 kilohertz. And along the horizontal axes I'm going to plot frequency. It's in kilohertz and I have to go from 10 kilohertz to 100 kilohertz so I'm going to do it in 5 kilohertz increments and that'll take me all the way down to 100 kilohertz. So XL on table 4.2 goes from 68 ohms up to 632 ohms. And XL on table 4.3 goes from 62 ohms all the way up to 648 ohms. Now the vertical axis is XL or the inductive reactants. Remember this is measured in ohms. So I have to go all the way up to somewhere around 650 ohms. So if I do it in 50 ohm increments, that will get me up to 650 ohms. Now plotting the line for L equals 10 millihenries is going to be difficult because there isn't subdivisions between the major grid divisions. So 1 kilohertz is going to be about there, 2 kilohertz about there, 3 kilohertz about there, 4 kilohertz somewhere around there. 5 kilohertz will at least be on a line. Try to do the best that you can. And remember that when you're joining these dots, they will be a straight line. So try and get the best fit for those dots that you've uh, plotted on here. Plotting the points for L equals 1 millihenry will be a lot easier for you because those dots will go on exact lines. And once again, this is going to be a linear graph. So try and draw your line through the best fit of all the points. So this is what your finished uh, graph should look like. You can see the higher the inductance, the more vertical the line. The lower the inductance, the more horizontal the line. So this graph shows you what L equals 10 millihenry looks like versus L equals 1 millihenry.
As with most labs, there are questions to be answered once you've completed your graph. I'm going to let you complete those on your own. So looking at question one, what is the relationship between inductive reactance and frequency? Well, I think it's linear because it was a straight line. Question two, what is the relationship between inductive reactance and inductance? Well, we use two different inductors, and I think the slope of the line has something to do with this answer. If the 10 millihenry trial had been repeated with frequencies 10 times higher than those in table 4.2, what effect would that have on the experiment? Well, thinking about it, the chart would have been easier because the frequencies would have been the same for both charts. However, the amount of resistance would change, so we'd need a longer horizontal axis. Do the coil resistances have any effect on the plots? Well, keeping in mind, for the 10 millihenry inductor, the coil resistance was 22 ohms. So XL is 68 ohms, and the coil resistance was 22 ohms, but our series resistor in the circuit was 10K ohms. And you have to remember that the current through an inductor rises at 90 degrees. So you have to remember the XL formula is at J, which is at 90 degrees, and our circuit has a 10K ohm resistor. So the resistance of the coil has to be compared to the resistor that we used in series, which was 10K ohms. XL of the inductor is at an angle of 90 degrees, so the resistance of the coil makes no difference to the inductor and is insignificant compared to the 10K ohm resistor we used in our circuit. When you've completed your lab, show it to your instructor so that they can initial it to indicate that it is complete.